morning. Shh. Morning, everyone. How are we doing? All right, everyone, a moment of silence, please. So we've had a pretty uh, rough week from happening in Boston. I've been uh, uh, at sort of West Texas. A moment of silence, please. All right, thank you very much. Um, does anyone have family near West or anyone nearby near Waco? Okay, well, our, our thoughts and prayers with everyone uh, in the community. Uh, I'll go where to start. Actually, my first day of teaching, I remember you know, a fall semester, there was a shooting at A&M. It happened like 15 minutes before my class started. That was always a good way to get started. So, any, uh, any questions? So, everyone knows we're doing the final review on Tuesday, right? No class on Thursday. If you come away from today, you'll be sitting by yourself. I won't be here. I mean, if you want to see me, fine, but I won't be in this classroom. Uh, any thoughts? Uh, thank you again. You did really well for Justice Busby. He wanted to uh, convey my thanks, uh, his thanks to you. Um, anyone's free today at 2. I think the answer is probably not, but at 2 o'clock, he's holding argument at the courthouse. It's right on uh, right down Harris. Uh, definitely check it out if you're free at 2, uh, although this is probably a really bad time of year if you do anything that's not study-related, so I, I understand if you can't go. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let's do a, a, a mini takings review, and let's let's just walk through the various strands of uh, takings tests. Um, this will be a uh, a good um, kind of good overview. So when I first started, I said that all right, you just got like some basic cases, and this will be fairly easy. But every time we add another case, it gets more complex. So this is really our last substantive class of the semester. I'm going to try and pull it all together. So let's just go one at a time and just walk through the various tests and other related. Um, I don't remember where I started. Um, Stephanie? Okay, so what was the test from Loretto? What, what, what did Loretto hold? That, that was the very first case we did with the, uh, with the um, cable spikes. Yeah. They said that um, the cable installation was a permanent physical occupation. Close. Permanent physical invasion. invasion. Yeah. But yeah, close. So the very first test was Loretto. This is when they installed the cable box and the wires inside the building, and it was a permanent physical invasion. And Stephanie, once a permanent physical invasion, what kind of analysis is used to find for takings? Under what circumstance is something let me put it this way. If there's a permanent physical invasion, what kind of analysis do the courts do? Well, they determine whether uh, it's physically touched. Right. And then what if there's a physical touching? Then it's, um, it has to be uh, permanent. Right. And what, what do we call that? A per se taking. Good. Yes. Per se or categorical taking. Is there any balancing? Right, no balancing. So this was the this was the easiest case, and that's why we did it first, right? If there's a physical touching, it's a per se taking, no matter what. Now it might be only a taking for you know one eighth of an inch or the width of that wire, but it's a taking no matter what. Okay. So, um, uh, Deanna, tell me about Penn Coal. How does how does Penn Coal uh, uh, differ from uh, Loretto? Good. So, what 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 did the what did the courts consider for Penn Cole? Or what's the name of the test as is commonly known? Um. Well, think of think of what were the facts of the case. It involves coal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, right. And you, so what, what was the test the court came up with? It wasn't a very helpful test. Yes. Yes, yes. It looks at the diminution in value. That, that's exactly what you're getting at. So the Penn Cole test looks at the diminution in value. And the Holmes opinion doesn't really define when it's a taking. But um, uh, Haley, do you remember the phrase just as Holmes used of... Uh, of when something's a taking under this test? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Kelly, last day of class. I'm, I'm 
terrible. Do you remember the the, the, the type of test or what what the, the key phrase was that that Holmes used? Yeah, it goes too far. Remember that? Goes too far. This wasn't very helpful, but Holmes said that we look at the diminution in value, how much value is being taken away from the guy's property, and if it goes too far, it's a taking, right? Okay, good. Uh, so, so Kelly, then let's let's move on to the the uh, the Hadachek case. What was the what was the test from the Hadachek case? This was the uh, with the baking clay. How was how was Hadachek different from a uh, Loretta or the or the Cole case? Okay, uh, Catherine. Uh, Lily? Had a check. What was the had a check case? What was, what was the holding rule from that case? Right. And if it's a nuisance, is there a taking? That's right, yeah. So if there's a nuisance, there's no taking. Right? Okay. Uh, Darren, I'll come back to you in a minute. You're you're about to be up, but save by save by coming late. All right. So um, so then uh, uh, you're, uh, Tiffany, right? So the the next case we did was Penn Central. In this arc, how does Penn Central differ from the test that came before? I know. That's okay. <laughs> There are a total of seven, so we're actually almost at the end. <laughs> there are basically seven different cases which you're going to need to keep in your head for this unit. The number two there, the goes too far, is that, if it does go too far, is that categorical? Or is it, if it no, no, no. The very, the very question of saying does it go too far is the balance it's itself. Okay. Categorical means if there's, a, if there's a touching or a taking, it's automatically uh, compensation is going to be paid. Here, it's look at how far it goes. So you balance the, remember the, 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 the parcel as a whole, you know, what's the uh, denominator? Okay. So Tiffany, remember Penn Central? This was the one we did with the, uh, with the building above Grand Central Station in uh, Manhattan. You remember this one? Mary? I remember it was in the taking. That's right. Why? Use those aerial rights other properties. <laughs> so you got these. You have to just memorize. Do you remember it, David? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just you got it. You have have these at your hand. So Penn Central said, okay. So so David uh, or Mary. So in, in Penn Central, was all of the value of the property being taken according to the court? Yeah. Right. So it was a less uh, than complete diminution in value. Okay, and David, what was that phrase you used before? You're close enough, right? So just 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 memorize or put this in your outline somewhere. So it, it looks at distinct investment-backed expectations, or if you want to be cool, just divvy. Uh, but but just just know the phrase. So we look to are there distinct investment-backed expectations, right? When Grand Central Station was purchased. Did they expect to be able to build a skyscraper above it? Did they invest money into it? Did they have uh, investments in it? And if the answer to that question is no, then they lose. Under the Penn Central test, 99% of the time, the government wins. It's like almost always. So if there's less than complete diminution in value, we apply Penn Central. And under Penn Central, the government wins. I mean, almost always. But at least you have to explain what are the uh, distinct investment-backed expectations. Okay. Everyone okay with that so far? Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Uh, so Jennifer, back to you. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, Lucas. This was a case that just, uh, Judge Busby did the other day. What was the, uh, what was the test from the Lucas case? How much economic value? Um. How was 
Lucas different from Penn Central with respect to the deprivation of value? Well, it didn't say that it had to be identical. Yes. <coughs> yes. Exactly. 100% diminution in value. Justice Scalia said, hey, this guy wants to build, you know, a, uh, a beachfront house on, on the beaches of South Carolina. You're telling him you can't build. You have now decreased 100% of the value of his property. And if there is a 100% uh, deprivation of property, is there a taking, uh, Jennifer? Yes, unless the property is considered. Yes. Well, not the property, the, 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 uh, the way it's being used, but yes. So it's a taking. Unless, and this is the weird part, the thing being regulated would have been a common law nuisance. So, for example, say a co you know, say, say for example, a person's property was emitting smoke, right? And there was a regulation placed on saying you can't emit smoke. That would be okay because a common law emitting smoke was a nuisance. Or say that you had like you know stinky pigs or stinky chickens or something, and said you can't put your stinky chickens here. Fine. But a common law, the idea of a you know environmental program to renourish the beach would have been fanciful. That didn't exist at common law. But this was Scalia, and you'll see the reading for today that this opinion has very limited vitality. Uh, uh, Justice Busby did a very good job explaining how it works in with the uh, the severance case in the Texas Supreme Court, where they actually used it. But the U.S. Supreme Court has really backed away from it. Okay. So let's go uh, to, to number six. So. Um, Lance, let's, let's talk about Palazzolo. How did Palazzolo, that was a case which you skimmed, but the Justice Buzzy mentioned. How did Palazzolo uh, limit Lucas? All right, anyone? It wasn't assigned for the reading. What was the case about again? Palazzolo. Did I not assign it? Yeah. So when I say skim, no one reads it. Yeah. You don't even skim it, do you? Okay, so basically, yeah. So what, what Paul Zalo said, it involved a moratorium where it said you couldn't build on the beach, I think it was Vermont or Rhode Island, I forget where. And what the court basically said was a moratorium on building is not a complete diminution. It basically gutted the holding of Lucas without doing so. It said, even if the state tells you you can't build, that's not a complete diminution of value. Why? Well, you can go camping there. You can go fishing there. You can do other things. You, just, you don't have to build something. Um, so, so, Lance, let me ask you this question. If a moratorium on building is not a complete diminution of value, what test do you apply? It wouldn't be a categorical test. You'd apply more, more balancing tests. Which, I mean, which one? Not from this list? Penn Central. Penn Central, that's right. So what the Palazzolo case basically said was, if there's a moratorium in building, you know, the state says you can't build, then we fall back to Penn Central. This is our good old-fashioned test, which we always use. Okay? Are we good with that? Okay, and then the final case, I mean, I say final not in the sense that there's, there's any continuity, but the last case we're going to be studying in this unit is the Tahoe case. And that, this case just reaffirms, and we'll go through this detail, if that it's less than a complete diminution of value, then you apply Penn Central. So this is basically the arc. We go from Loretto, which was always a taking, down to Tahoe, where you have all these balancing factors, right? And the only weird one in the middle is the Lucas case, but as the dissent notes, Lucas requires 100% diminution of value. If you have a 95% diminution of value, then you go to Penn Central. And don't forget, when you're on Penn Central, the government wins. It, it, it just, it's so rare that the government loses under Penn Central, it just almost never happens. Okay. <clears throat> Questions? Have something like this handy, because I'm, I, I can guarantee you that... Uh, Sam, well, some sort of taking questions on it. And I'm going to, I mean, if you looked at the questions from last year, I'm going to have something that, you know, is similar to maybe one of these or maybe somewhere between two, and you have to figure out which test to apply. And I can't tell you how many students last year said, well, there's a categorical taking under Loretto, so let's apply Penn Central. I'm like, no, that's wrong. I, I, three people did that exact same mistake, so don't, don't do it. Yes, sir. Just from a practical uh, standpoint, I, if you're applying Penn Central, 
So when you apply it, it's not going to diminish. Does that mean there's not a taking? Okay, no, so these are separate inquiries. Okay. The only way there's a taking is under Penn Central if there's a, 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 the violation of the Dibbies. Okay. So you first say, you know, hi, I own Grand Central Station. You're diminishing the value of my property. Okay, let's see how far the diminution goes. And then we'll start balancing the factors. And if it goes too far, then it's a taking and you have to pay. Once it's a taking, the government has to pay. So if it's not a taking, the government doesn't have to pay. I was just sorry, I was confused. Terminology. Yeah. Central government wins, but there still can be a taking. No, no, no. If the government wins, there's no taking. Because once there's a taking, compensation must be paid. That's what the Fifth Amendment says. The second a court finds a, a taking, they have to pay compensation. And that's what the government does not want to do. So it's not a taking until the court says so. Once it's taking, then you have to pay. So at this point, the law in Penn Central is just a you know, land use regulation. The same way you know, a zoning law would be. That would be a Kendra Euclid. Okay? So for to not find it, to find a taking, there has, the state investment-based expectations must have existed. Yes. And the government tax would have to go against those expectations. Yes, and that almost never happens. Sure. Because generally speaking, if they had the expectations to build something, they would have done it already. Yeah, I mean, the reason why Penn Central fails is if you have the expectations to build something, you would have done it already. The reason why most companies don't have these expectations is because they know they won't be able to build. So you're in this weird catch-22 where the government won't let you build anything, so you have no expectations, but you can't have expectations because you won't be able to build. Yes, ma'am? No, no, all seven of these are regulatory takings. The first case we did a kilo. This was when there was a physical taking, you know, eminent domain. That's easy. But here, these seven these are all regulatory takings, where the person's property is not being bulldozed, right? Okay? Everyone good with this? Yes, sir. So are we looking at both the more and the investment Well, well, well here's the rub. In many respects, Penn Coal, I'm sorry, in many respects, Penn Central modified Penn Coal. The Holmes test, the, the, this, this one that goes too far, right? That's useless. That, that doesn't give us anything to apply. So what the court did in the 70s with the Penn Central test, sorry, scrolling too much, was that how do we know something goes too far? Because it, 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 it extinguishes these dippies. Penn Central gave meat to the bones of Penn Coal. See, I promise you, when I first talked to you, I said this won't make sense, but in the last day, it all kind of comes together. Okay. How are we doing? Everyone okay with that? Okay. All right. Let's, um, let's, do, let's do the Tahoe case, okay? By the way, everyone saw this? This is the uh, sample final exam and answer. I, I, I put it in the blog for today. So here's the question. Here's the answer. It's exactly 499 words. I got it like ju just in the, in the limit. Um, I highly recommend don't cheat. Go look at the question first. Uh, do the entire question and then go to the answer. As well as if you go to my website, you can also see, I think, four other questions from last semester. So you're actually lucky. So if you go to property, um, uh, property two from last semester, the fall, and then you can see final exam. There's a link for it right there. There's final exam. So you click that. And you will see uh, the exam for my first section and then the, the A plus answer. And then the exam for the second answer and the A plus answer there. Go do them. I mean, I didn't change in six months. This is going to be very similar to what the exam I give now. I mean, uh, I have I have some really mess of fact patterns here. They're 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 they're, they're twisted, but it will be the same style. And time yourself. Give yourself an hour or ninety minutes. I mean, you have two questions for three hours. So give yourself ninety minutes. Yeah, you do. Um, a couple of you have already told me you've done them. You've done sample exams. You, uh, some of you tried showing them to me. And and you know, these 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 are people we have to compete with. They, they've gotten a head start. So I want all of you to do as well as you can. Um, I have a forced curve, but I do. If you go on the register, I, I give the highest possible grade on the forced curve. Um, it's actually really complicated. I have to give so many C's and so many B's, but I was able to give the most A's and B's with the fewest C's. It, it took a while, but I was able to jigger it. So, so if you do well, I will reward you, um, and uh, hopefully you get a, get a get a good grade that you deserve. Okay. Are we good with that? Okay. Oh, by the way, yes, sir. This one is mine, so it's probably not very good. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure they're. 
I mean, I wrote the question, so I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I'm blinded by the fact that I wrote it that I'm missing certain things are obvious. Um, even when I was grading last semester, kids came up with, kid, with things I didn't see. I was like, wow, that's pretty good. I didn't see that, and I gave you no, know, I gave points for that. Um, I, I write these questions to be extremely evil and have lots and lots of various issues that are just meant to go in various directions. Okay. Oh, before I forget, I want to do the um, the uh, the things to the evaluations. So if um, someone will volunteer to bring these up to the eighth floor, okay. So uh, I'll with like ten minutes left, I'll hand these out. That's good. That's good for everyone. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to do it during the review, but I figured people are just not going to be the right state of mind at that point. They're going to just trash me. So we'll do it now. <laughs> I, I, I seriously give it thought. I was like, no, that's not. That's a bet. I'm not going to be nervous. Asshole black man. So we'll, we'll, do, we'll do it today. So has anyone ever been to Tahoe? Is it, is it, is it as beautiful as, as um, the, the, the book says it is? Yeah. More. Way better than this <laughs> Yeah. Like this? Yeah, that's from Wikipedia. Um, so yeah, so so Lake Tahoe is this beautiful lake. Um, I haven't I haven't been there. I know. <laughs> that, I'm sure that that add like five dollars to the cost of your book. <laughs> and um, the interesting thing about Tahoe is it's it's directly on the border of Nevada and uh, California. So if you look here, it goes right down the border. And um, one of the interesting things about the Constitution is it actually takes into account these kind of interstate problems. So does anyone know what an interstate compact is? Has anyone ever heard of that? So this is actually in the Constitution, this fucking called a, a compacts clause. So say if like two states want to do something together, they actually have to get the permission of Congress to do so. So for example, your Texas driver's license, right? It works when you go to Louisiana, or it works when you drive to Oklahoma. Why? Because all 50 states have entered into a compact recognizing interstate uh, uh, driver's license. That wasn't accidental. Uh, Louisiana has to agree with Texas. Um, for those of you who are uh, uh, firearms aficionados, there's also uh, concealed carry uh, uh, compacts where if you have a permit from, say, Utah, you can use your concealed carry permit in like 30 states. So these are agreements that are reached. So we have Nevada and California, and they both uh, want to, um, you know, take care of, the, of, this, of this, uh, this pristine lake. So they put together this Tahoe Regional Planning Authority, which is this basically group to kind of, uh, uh, you know, take care of this collective action problem. Because if California does all the work on this side, and Nevada, Nevada keeps you know, crapping into the lake, whatever, it's still going to be in a bad situation. So they have this compact, and Congress agrees to it. But the problem is, Nevada starts slacking, you know, and California says, we want to do this ourselves, so they kind of go with their, their own. So one of the means they, 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 they adopt in order to uh, improve the quality of the environment is to put a stop on, on building. This is called a moratorium. Um, the reason for the moratorium is basically uh, them saying, like, look, we don't know the impact of this construction. We don't know what's going to happen. So let's, um, let's just take a break. We'll stop building for a couple years. We'll do environmental tests. We'll do studies. We'll do surveys. We'll do research. And then maybe after we have this, you know, this investigation in you know, three or four years, we'll be able to turn it back on. Right? But as is often the case with government planning, it doesn't actually work that way. So they say, oh, we maybe need one year or two years. And then the moratorium goes a third year, and a fourth year, and a fifth year, and a sixth year. And it keeps going on and on. And, uh, you know, these property owners, I'm, I, I don't know. Maybe you guys know. How much would a house cost on the shore, on the shore of Lake Tahoe? I'm guessing some ridiculous amount of money, right? Like just for the land, right? So you have these property owners saying, listen, we, we, we bought this land, you know, for God, you know, lots and lots of money. And we can't build. So you had these property owners who brought suit, okay? And they claimed that this was a taking. Now there's one phrase which we haven't talked about before, but we, we've, we've addressed indirectly. An inverse condemnation. It sounds like evil, but it's not. Something you would do in a gymnastic move of some sort. Uh, 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 Alvaro, what's, what's an inverse condemnation? What, what does that mean? Okay, well, let, let me ask the question this way. So in the very first case we did, you know, Kilo, who brought the proceedings to, uh, to take the house? The government. The government. They said, listen, we want to demolish your house because we want to build this, you know, uh, we, we want to give this land and we'll take it to Pfizer and they'll build a factory, right? That's called a taking or a condemnation proceeding. Uh, Chris, in this case... So did the inverse thing. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why I like you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, now explain what that means. Oh. Instead of 
instead of them taking uh, your land to build a house, they're going to take the lands that you can't build a house or take your house. That's a really good guess, but not right. <laughs> it's exact. Well, well, but focus on who brought the suit. In Kilo, it was, like Alvaro mentioned, it's a government who brought the suit, right? Here, in this case, who brought the suit? The, the, the people. Are the, the, yes. Yeah, the people are the, or the groups that like represent. Who, yeah, the property owners, right? So in the first case, who's at Kilo saying, "Don't take my house. Stop the bulldozers," right? Here they're saying, "Okay, you want to pass this law? Fine, but pay me." It's the opposite. So with the regular condemnation, the government uh, uh, goes to court to take the property, and the property owner tries to stop it or, and seek compensation. Oh, actually, or seek compensation, right? But with an inverse condemnation, it's the exact opposite. With inverse condemnation, the um, I was, I was going to say, the the property owner says that the government uh, regulation is actually a taking and wants money. I want to see the difference. In the first one, the government's take the government saying, "Yep, we're taking your property. We want to pay you for it." But the, uh, you know, the Suzette Kilo is trying to stop it. With the inverse condemnation case, saying, listen, the government passed this law. The government says it's not a taking. If you ask the government, they say, no, 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 it was just a land use regulation, right? But the property owner says, no, no, this is a taking. And because it's a taking, you've got to pay up. And in court, what does the government say? It's not a taking. So here, the government admits it's a taking. And with the inverse condemnation, the government says not a taking. Everyone see the difference? The difference is who's bringing the suit. Is it the government saying we're taking your property, or is the landowner saying, "Hey, you're taking my property"? In either case, the government changes the position. With Suzette Kilo, there's no doubt they were taking our house. Everyone admitted that, right? I mean. They want, to, they want to bulldoze their house, so the pictures. Here, Tom's saying, no, no, we're not taking the value of your property. We're just saying you can't build for six years. You know, your, your property's still there. You can go camping there, do whatever you want. So the cases that we did today, the, uh, or, or I guess the, uh, we did the Lucas case, we did the Palazzolo case, we did the Tahoe case. All these cases are inverse <coughs> condemnation because all of the property owners brought suit saying, don't take my property, or if you're going to take my property, you're going to have to pay for it. Everyone see that? We get that? Okay. So just just know who's bringing these kinds of suits when the, when these laws are passed. So in this case, the plaintiffs filed suit. Well, they tried to find that this, this act was unconstitutional, but they also said, in, in the event it's a law is constitutional, is this a taking, right? So they go through the district court opinions at some length, and I think that's because Justice Stephen wants to say he you know he likes those opinions. Um, but the district court looks at it two different ways. There's the issue of whether there's a, uh, a taking under Penn Central. And all the parties pretty much agree that the answer to that question is no. Um, it's kind of a weird thing, but believe it or not, in this area, the average time it takes to construct the house is 25 years. I think it said some of that in the opinion, right? 25 years. Permitting all the requirements and stuff. So, with that crazy fact, it's actually reasonable to say that no one could have honestly expect to build within six years, right? If it takes an average of twenty-five years to build, and you, you can't build for six years, you know, it's reasonable enough to say that you have investment back expectations to build at that time. Also, the commission had been in you know business for a while, and if you were a property owner, you would have known this was coming down the pike. This was not like a surprise that they sprung up at your last minute. They said. You know, in a couple of years, we're going to have this moratorium, so you, you cannot have any kind of reasonable in, you know, reliance interest in that. So that part, no one really contested, and they, they kind of didn't even appeal that. The issue, though, was for the six-year period, though, was there a complete diminution in value? In other words, we were only looking, or the property owners said, we were only looking at this six-year period when we couldn't build. And they said, under Lucas, it's a taking. Uh, 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 Chris, or John, why was it a taking under Lucas? Because under Lucas, twenty percent of the value has to be diminished. Right. right. So here, there was still value that was left over. Okay. Right. So, so 
the court, that's what the court held, but the property owner said, you are taking 100% of the value. This is just like Lucas. Remember in Lucas, they said you can't build on the beaches of South Carolina. Here they're saying you can't build on the, leech, uh, on the, be you know, on the, on the shore of Lake Tahoe. Um, so th they said there was a taking. The, um, the, the district court and also the Ninth Circuit had this kind of weird opinion by focusing you not just on the uh, spatial elements but the temporal elements. You try to look at you know how you know the three-dimensional view of property. You have you know the the, the meets and bounds, and you have the uh, function, then you have the, the time, and and all this transcendent gobbledygook, which a court just rejects. So so that that's kind of silly. But but there is a kernel of truth in it. And if you think back to property one, when we define an, es an estate, we think of you know who has it and how long do they have it for, right? You know like you know, from, from, from Josh to uh, Mary for, for life. Okay, so that's a life estate that Mary has. So it's not unreasonable to think of property in terms of a life, you know, of time. So if there's some sort of diminution of value for the entirety of Mary's life, uh, you know, that would be a complete diminution of value for her, even though this property will probably go on past her life. So there is some merit in that, but it, it, the way the Ninth Circuit wrote it was just kind of weird. So this gets up to the, uh, up to the Supreme Court, okay? And if you notice, uh, the authorship of the opinion is Justice Stevens. Um, now, I didn't mention this on purpose the other day, but Justice Busby, uh, he clerked for Justice White and Justice Stevens. So I, I didn't want to mention that part because his, his boss wrote one of the opinions. Uh, no, actually, his, boss, his former boss wrote the dissent in the Lucas case. And what happens was, in, the, in Lucas, Stevens was in dissent. Here, he's in the majority. So he won, Scalia lost. So this opinion was really about just limiting the import of Lucas. Okay. He goes on, and he, he, he Stevens has this weird kind of analysis where he, he starts talking about the Fifth Amendment. Uh, he makes I think a couple of uh, uh, mistakes. He says something like, you know, uh, the Fifth Amendment uh, provides for a public purpose, but in fact it's public use. You know that. Um, he then goes on and talks about how this entire doctrine of regulatory takings. You know, all seven of these tests, or I guess, you know, most of them, they basically began with Penn Cole, that in many respects, Holmes kind of invented this out of, out of kind of a whole cloth. There wasn't a, a strong tradition of this before, and Stephen doesn't like it. He would, he would just as well say, any land use regulation that doesn't take your property is, uh, is not a taking. Uh, he also says that we shouldn't, he also says that we shouldn't be treating uh, regulatory takings the same way as physical takings. What do you think about that, Bill? Well, uh, I guess a physical taking would be a, a, a pretty obvious reading of the Fifth Amendment. Right. And that um, and it's an obvious action when the government's physically taking your uh, property. So, and when that happens, you should get money. Uh, but if, you, like you said, if these regular taking, taking is a relatively new invention, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're two separate things. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a psychological difference. When I showed you those pictures a couple weeks ago, Suze Kilo and her house getting bulldozed, right? You see that. I and mean, that's something palpable that you can see. Her house is getting bulldozed down. But when you look at something like this, and you see, oh, look, there's not a house there. You don't see that. It's kind of like an unseen cost. You don't see the cost of the regulatory taking. Or if you look at, this is actually the house of Mr. Nolan, right? And, you know, whether or not there's an easement right here, you don't know that. It's not visible. So there's a huge psychological element to the physical taking. And for Stevens, he's saying, listen, we'll, we'll, we'll police this strongly. But these regulatory takings, not so much. Of course, Stevens wrote the opinion in Kilo, right? That was his majority opinion where he basically said anything the government wants to do that can increase the uh, economic uh, welfare of a community is okay. It's a public use. So uh, John Paul Stevens would read the takings clause out of the Constitution. He he's not uh, he does not have much uh, much care for the Constitution. He's not in the court anymore, uh, so uh, his views are much less relevant now. But for many years, he basically limited the takings power. Okay. So let's go back to this entire idea of, of the complete diminution in value. Uh, Iman, does Justice Stevens accept the fact that we should only be looking at the six-year period? Yeah, for the majority in, in, in the in the Nolan, no, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, the Tahoe case. Does he say it's okay to only look at the six-year period as kind of like you know this, this, this one block? Because you have to look at it as a whole over time. Exactly. 
So what Stephen says is it's wrong to only look at it for the six years. Of course, if you're only looking at it for these six years, it can't do anything, although he would disagree with that. But he says we need to look at the entirety. This is the same denominator issue. The same way in Penn Coal that we looked at the, uh, where is it? The same way in Penn Coal where we looked at, you know, it was homeless versus Brandeis. Are we only looking at the coal underneath this house? We're looking at the coal in the entire lot, right? The same way in Penn Central, are we only looking at the air rights above the building? We're we looking at the entire, you know, lot of the property. Uh, he says here in, Penn, in Tahoe, why are we only looking at this one little six-year plot? It takes 25 years to build a house. Why don't we look at the entirety of the value? And if we look at everything, it's clear that there's not a complete diminution of value. It's less than 100%, right? And even the Lucas case, the, the court admitted that if it's 99%, it's not going to be a categorical, categorical taking, okay? So Landon, if we're less than 100%, if we're at 99%, which of these, which of these tests do we start applying? Cool. As modified by, don't forget this point. I'm glad you said that. Yes. Penn Coal by itself doesn't really have any vitality anymore. If you, if you tell me Penn Coal, remember Penn Central. I mean, they're, they're PC. They're both Pennsylvania. That's actually an easy one to, to link the, the mentally. If you tell me Penn Coal, say, okay, but how do we define it? Well, we go to Penn Central. We look, are there distinct investment back expectations that the government is, is you know, extinguishing? The answer to that question is no, then it's not a taking. So what Stephen says is, listen, this is not a complete diminution of value. You can do other things in the land. You can go camping, you can you know, watch birds, you can you know, go swimming, I don't know. But it's not 100%. And once you're less than 100%, you know, if you're at 99%, right? I, like less than 100%. If you're, if you're at 99%, you go to Penn, Col uh, Penn Central. Okay, everyone get that? There, see, I'm tempted to teach um, Lucas on the same day as, uh, as Tahoe, but if I did that, you would just ignore Lucas altogether. Because this case basically killed Lucas. Lucas is so good to understand conceptually, but this Tahoe basically killed it. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at an exam question or something, if you see something that's similar to Lucas and there's actually a complete diminution of value and it might be a common law nuisance, that might be the right answer, but more likely than not, it's Tahoe. Um, you know, I've been, I don't know the exact question, but th this is more or less the controlling law right now. Okay, questions about that? Yes, sir. In this case, I thought it was 100% diminution of value, it's just a brief period. Is what made it. Yeah, well, 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 two things, and, and I think you're right. So the first thing is Stephen says it was never 100% value. He goes, you can still camp there and do other things there, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not 100%. But even assuming uh, um, if it was, it's wrong to limit it to the six-year window. We should look at the entirety. You know, fee simple goes on infinite, right? We should look at the entirety of the parcel. So Stephen says two things. Is one, it's not 100% diminution. And two, we shouldn't be limiting to our six-year window. We should look at everything. So what Stevens basically said was, we look at all factors. And if you look at all factors, of course you're never going to have 100%. Now, now, there's possible one distinction that the moratorium, in this case, was temporary, right, versus the moratorium in the South Carolina was permanent. And that, that might be one distinguishing factor. But even in Stevens' dissent in the South Carolina case, he said, well, I don't care if it's a permanent moratorium. You can still go fishing and camping. So it's not 100%. So if you ask Stevens, you always apply Penn Central and the government always wins. That, that's basically the same thing. Same thing for Kilo. You apply broad public purpose, government wins. That's, uh, and actually just two days ago, the Supreme Court denied certiorari on a case out of Guam that would have uh, considered whether the public use clause has some more teeth and they, they denied cert on it. It was basically the government of Guam just took this guy's house without any reason, uh, some sort of political whatever, and the, and the court uh, refused to take it. So, uh, take his clause is a is a pretty dead letter at this point. Yes, sir. So can the government do a physical taking to the state and you say it's too big now? Like, well, but wouldn't be a taking though. That'd be like had a check. So say there was a nuisance, like a guy's baking bricks in his backyard in Los Angeles. The government passed a law saying there is no baking of brick within city limits. 
that would not be a taking because it's a regulation that, that abates a nuisance. So be very careful. This goes to the question Lance said. Once you call it a taking, that's a very specific word. Once you call it a taking, you have to pay compensation. There's no such thing as a taking without compensation. There can be a, a land use regulation or a zoning statute. Call it something else. But once you call it a taking, you need to pay up. That's why in this case, in the Tahoe case, the property owners are saying, you're taking our property. You're take it's a taking. It's a taking. But the city said, no, no, we're not taking. We're just, we're just you know, environmental regulation or, or something. Yes, sir. But with what Aaron said, I guess there would be no motivation for the government yes. to stop a nuisance by actual physical taking. They why, why would they pay when they do it for free, right? I mean, there, there's a plus to that because when the government pays money that comes from the taxpayers, right? I mean, there, there is, there's, a, there's a legitimate public policy interest with the government not having to pay every land use, every landowner for, you know, doing something. Uh, Mary, your hand was up? Well, just Lucas, they couldn't ever build on the lots. That's right. So, so yeah. Tahoe was just a six-year That's right. moratorium. That's right. You know, things well, well if you, I, I see, I agree. I think that's an important difference. But if you look at Justice Stevens' dissent in the Lucas case that we did on Tuesday, what Stevens said dissent was, even if it's a complete diminution, for, I'm sorry, even if it's a permanent ban, they can still go camping there, right? They can still look at birds. So they can still do something. So it's like 99.9%. To Stevens, it's never a complete diminution. It's impossible. As long as you have fee simple, you own it, that's, that's property. Yes, sir. Would it make a difference if Instead of six years, it was 99 years? To Justice Stevens? No. Well, to, to the point that Mary just raised, to Stevens, as long as you have it, you own it in fee simple, you do not have complete diminution of value. Yes, ma'am. You don't say, right? Even really? <laughs> so, so Justice Thomas had a dissent where he made that exact point. Um, he said, uh, uh, quote, these individuals and families are deprived of the opportunity to build homes and, and retirement uh, houses uh, on land upon which this construction is authorized and purchased. Okay? What Thomas said in his dissent was these people paid a lot of money for shore, for shorefront property, for the exact purpose of building a house. That's why they bought this land. They didn't. You don't buy a lot on, a, on shore of Lake Tahoe to go bird watching. You don't do that. People, right? Maybe people do. I don't know. You're laughing. But I'm laughing just because I told her that my mother-in-law actually bought a piece of property that they don't put anything on specifically for hunting and. Bird <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to change my notes for next year. I guess I'm <laughs> Texas. I don't know. But anyway, in Tahoe. The land's in Alaska. Okay. Well. Okay. In 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 uh. On the shores of Lake Tahoe. I mean, I I can I'll, I'll Zillow it, but I'm guessing you know, uh, the average the average lot price is in probably the tens of millions of dollars. I I don't even know how much it costs. I'm just like Lake Tahoe. California. I don't even know what's going to come up. What's that? Uh, okay, so yeah, there actually are no. Hold on. Let's just zoom in right here. I'm just curious. Okay. Okay, so that, there's a $5 million house right there. Right, I think that's. Uh, hold on, let's see. $3 million. Okay, so yeah, I mean, they're short. Okay, here we go. Price high to low. Yeah, so four million, five million, three million. Yeah, these are these are expensive properties. These are ex very expensive properties. And and I, I, with all respect to your family, they didn't spend four million dollars to go bird watching. <laughs> they didn't go that much to go camping. That people in Tahoe they don't go camping. Or maybe they do. I don't know. But 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, the Stevens opinion says as long as you have fee simple, it doesn't matter. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, what do you, what do you mean? What would what would the government's perspective be versus the private owner's perspective be? Well, the private owner's um, factors would be building a house and the purpose of the land. And the private owner has a finite life, right? 
people are, I mean, fee simple is forever, but my life is limited, right? Say I'm, I bought this land for a retirement house, right? People do that. I'm only be alive for a number of years. There might be a moratorium for the remainder of my life. So I might, might, every, I might not ever be able to get any benefit out of it. Yes, sir. What, what if you have a leasehold and the government says you can't build you know, like a snow cone shack chain you have to the snow cone shack there for 20 uh -huh. years? You have a 25-year moratorium, so it renders your leasehold uh, completely. I don't know if a person with a leasehold would have standing to challenge taking the, the original person who owns in fee simple would probably be the one challenging it. So I'm trying to think. I know there are cases where if eminent domain is applied to an apartment building, right, that you're renting from, the, per, the owner of the leasehold won't get compensation. The, the person who gets compensation is the owner of the um, the fee simple. Then you can see that guy in contract law. Right, and then you can move for breach of the of the lease for 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 you know evicting you beforehand, and then he'd have to indemnify you. Yeah, it's not a. This is not a, a happy thing, especially for Texas. I mean, if you were in like New York, or you know, yeah, take the property for the lake. But but here, I think people realize that it's, it's a very, you know, these, these are actually. Uh, I, I bet all these houses are on the Cal on the Nevada side, actually. Oh no, these are on the California side. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I mean, this is. Uh, and I mean, there's only houses at the bottom tip of this the entire remainder is. is no, no, Okay, let's. Lake. Oh, it's not called Lake Tahoe, Nevada. Okay, I don't know. I'll look at this. You can. Someone else can look at this. But anyway, <laughs> everyone, everyone get that. So the dissent's basically, listen. This is this is this is this is no different than Lucas. You're making up this thing of like, well, because it's a temporary moratorium at six years versus you know, forever. For the purpose of these people, it might as well be forever. Because California would say, oh yeah, give us another year, and another year. And another year, and then before you know, it's like thirty years, and uh, that's not an accident either. I mean, these delays are not always so uh, uh, good faith. Okay. Uh, so that, that's that's the general idea. Uh, just the the takeaway also is with respect to inverse condemnation, uh, it's the property owner challenging and saying, "Hey, you're taking my property, give me compensation for it." Okay. Okay. Everyone good with that? All right. Let's go on to the, the last God, last topic of the year. It's, it's sad. This is a, but this is exactly where I thought we'd be at this point, so we're good. Uh, exactions. So this is kind of a, a weird topic because it's also of a fairly recent uh, vintage. It only came out like the late 80s in the Supreme Court. State courts have had it for a while, but it's fairly novel. So... Um, this is the, the uh, property from Nolan. Uh, where is it? Between windows. This was the original bungalow in Nolan. It was kind of this, like, you know, dump. It wasn't in very good condition, right? And Mr. Nolan wanted to demolish it and build a nice new house, which maybe he could rent out or whatever. Uh, I'll come back to this picture later. Generally speaking, right? Uh, where was I? Oh, so, okay. Generally speaking, if a person wants to build a piece of property, right, can the state have certain generally applicable zoning laws telling you how you have to build the property? So, for example, you know, Texas passes a law that says, you know, if you want to build um, property on the beachfront of Galveston, you need to uh, provide a, an, a, an easement for the public the cross. Like that was like the New Jersey case. Would there be any problem with that? No, no, my, my, my question was Texas passes a general law applicable to everyone. So if you want to build beachfront property, you need to have some sort of an easement provided. Okay. So if there's a general zoning law that says if you want to do this, you need to have an easement. Or, you know, if you're building on the beach, right, you can't build more than two stories high. Right. Would there be any problem with that? No. Okay. But what if something else happened? What if the general law said, you can build in the beach however many stories you want, or you can build in the beach without an easement? But here, Mr. Nolan, he wanted to build on the beach. The legislature of California hadn't passed any laws like this, but the California Coastal Commission, which is kind of this weird regulatory agency, they're very powerful in California, said, listen, all right, we'll give you this permit, but 
you got to give us an easement. What's that like? I mean, it's like a negotiation for being able to build on that. Are you, do you actually negotiate with the government? So I, I think I mentioned this when we talked about the eminent domain power in Kilo. When the government wants to condemn your property and they make you an offer, it's like it's like a, a Don, Don Corleone. It's an offer you can't refuse. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but you can't refuse it because if you refuse it, they'll take you to court and take it anyway and give you less money. Here, it's, it's slightly worse. Mr. No one wants to build this new house. I mean, his house is old and dilapidated. probably won't even meet the, the, the safety codes. They said, all right, we will give you this land as long as you give us an easement for it. Um, it's borderline extortion. Uh, so there's, there's, this, there's this old, uh, um, uh, anyone have the Jack Benny show? I never hear of it. it was this old show on like in the 50s. Um, and there's this old bit. You know, Jack Benny's walking, right? And a burglar goes up to him and says, your money or your life? Puts a gun to his head. Your money or your life, right? And then Benny's going, oh, I don't know. And then the burglar goes, what's wrong? Your money or your life? And he goes, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> there it is. Is there actually a choice? There's no actual choice. I mean, if he has to give his money, he dies. So the fact that he's thinking about it is funny. Um, and this actually came up in the healthcare arguments where uh, the Chief Justice said, you know, uh, the federal government's trying to give money to the states for the Medicaid expansion, but if they deny the money, they lose all their funding. So it's this weird thing where the government says, okay, we'll give you this if you give us th whatever. We'll give you this permit if you give us an easement. But it's no actual negotiation because they refuse. They, they don't get anything. They die. Effectively. Their property is dead. So we have this situation where this kind of this is extortion. And this is very attractive for governments because it allows them to get stuff for free that they wouldn't have otherwise. And they can do it at the very time someone needs it. When this guy wants to demolish this, you know, this garbage bungalow and build a, you know, a, a nice shorefront property, uh, uh, you know, they can just demand it. The book says it's like printing money. So this became a very attractive mechanism by which property owners, I'm sorry, by which the government could, could gain uh, uh, various benefits. Okay? It was actually funny. I was, I was actually in California last when I read this case near the coast, so I had this weird memory seared in my mind of being near it, but I think I was not too far from it. I was in Santa Clara, and this was... Uh, uh, not too far from where it was. So, so what happens is, so he applied for the permit, right? He says, I want to build. And they say, you can only build if you give us an easement. So, so this is the, the Nolan's house. And basically what they wanted was a, uh, an easement that the public could cross along here. Not a very good picture. You can kind of see it better here. But there's this kind of... Um, uh, uh, like a beach wall or, or like a, you know, for, to prevent the ties from rushing in. And there's a little ladder there. So they wanted the ability to kind of cross over here. Okay. And what did Mr. Nolan say to that request? Um, no, he filed a petition with the, uh, with the court to uh, mm -hmm. validate the, uh, the condition. On what ground? Um, he said that the, uh, there had to be an impact on public access to the Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, to go back to a phrase we talked about with Chris, what, what did he claim was going on here? What did he assert was actually going on? Um, that they just wanted to take the land. Yes, without paying for it. Mm -hmm. This was, he did a couple things. One, he said, they can't do this because, you know, it's a taking. Or alternatively, if it is a taking, pay me. Right? The government doesn't want to pay. So they're going to say, no, 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 it's not a taking, it's just a land use regulation. So this is the same dynamic we, we talked about with uh, uh, Chris with the inverse condemnation proceedings a few minutes ago. So he brought the suit um, and went up and down the courts, uh, and eventually it was narrowed down to the takings question. Is it a taking of property for the government to condition this uh, uh, a permit to build, right, on providing an easement? And it's kind of a kind of a weird case. And let's before we get to the the law, let's talk about the analysis. So, um, okay. So, so Vanessa, if you're you know you're walking down the down the street right here, and uh, you look at this piece of property right, and you want to maybe go to the beach. When you look at just this guy's property right here, would you think in your in your mind that 
maybe I could cross here and go to the beach. Yeah. Why? Um, I could just go on the side of the building. Now, before you took this class, would you think that was trespassing? Um. <laughs> now, after we've taken like, all those jersey cases, but I mean, probably, right? Yeah. Someone else? So, psychologically, right? The, the, the state, California, has an interest in promoting access to the beach. Uh, you know, the, the California coast goes, you know, hundreds of miles, and it's just a beautiful beach. And they want people to, to be, you know, to be friendly to the beach and to go to the beach. Of course, though, we know that property along the beach is owned by private people. So in California, as in most cases like Texas, you know, the water's commons, the water belongs to the public. The, the wet sand, as Justice Busby drew those little pretty lines on the board, this belongs to the public. The dry sand, though, is kind of this weird thing where it kind of belongs to these private owners, but as we saw in the Jersey case, you need to have a lateral right to cross across it. Okay? So there's no dispute, right, that people have the right to cross it. That's not disputed. What's disputed, though, is whether there has been easement to do so. Because if you remember with the beach cases, you can allow people to permissibly cross your land. You'll frequently see this, a sign that says, you know, uh, you are allowed to cross the land here to get to the beach. You'll see that. I've, I've seen it in other lakes and stuff. But what the government here wanted was not just the right to be able to cross it. They also wanted an easement for it. Why that makes a difference? Well, instead of having fee simple, now there's an encumbrance on it. You now have, uh, 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 you know, a cloud hanging over your property. And if you want to sell it, your, your property is now worth less. Right? You have an easement on it. So the guy said, no, 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 listen. If people want to get, you know, here, that's fine. If I remember the facts, it was actually a public beach a couple blocks away. Uh, so it, it, it seems silly to me if there's a public beach a few blocks away, you need to give people access over private land, but that, that's, you know, it's California. But they say, listen, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to stop you. We want to cross, fine, but no easement. So went to the Supreme Court, right? And to starters, again, this was a Stevens, I'm sorry, a Scalia majority. Actually, did, no, Brennan wrote the dissent, not Stevens. So it was a Scalia majority. Okay. So first, Scalia makes a point. So Alex, say, say assuming in the first place, California had a general law that said, you know, uh, any construction on the beach, you know, must require an easement to provide it. That was a general law. Would that be okay? Okay, yeah. So... Scalia is okay with that. Says, listen, if you want to have a law saying that you know beachfront property, you have to have an easement. It can only be two stories high. It can't be more than X number of square feet. You know, you need to have a certain amount of you know square feet in front of the yard and to the beach. All that's fine. What makes this different is the condition. Whereas, like, there's this kind of coercive element where it's like, okay, you want this? Twisting your arm, we'll give it to you if you give us this easement. And that really uh, um, makes Scalia mad. He basically says you can't, you know. Uh, you can't allow violations of the law in order to uh, benefit the government. So say if the law said you can't build here, but the government said, all right, we'll let you build here if you give us some money. Or we'll let you build here if you give us this easement. That's kind of almost bribery. And, and, and I don't put that lightly, but this is a form of extortion for property owners. Um, and uh, it's a, <laughs> it, it's, this case had a lot of impact because the California Coastal Commission was doing some really... Uh, 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 crazy stuff for over the years. So Scalia says we can't have this extortion, right? But the problem is actually defining a test to see when there's kind of this exaction. So, um, uh, Andrew, what what kind of test does uh, does uh, Scalia come up with to figure out if there's an exaction? It's not a rational basis. And you actually one case ahead that's an indolent case. What, what does Scalia look to to see if... Uh, if there's a uh, if, if there's an exaction here, okay. Well, not exactly. Let me ask like this. Okay. So there's this word nexus, but let's walk it through. Okay. So as Vanessa, uh, we mentioned a moment ago, the, the state said, look, there's some sort of psychological impact. Okay. If I'm walking down the street and I'm looking at the beach, I want to be able to have a, uh, you know, an understanding in my head that it's okay for me to cross. So, um, Aaron, um, 
is it necessary to provide an easement in order for people to have a psychological well-being? Why? Or, or what does Scalia think about that? Well, that's what the state said, but does Scalia agree with that? Why not? Yes. Bradford, could could this end this uh, this this interest of the state to have the psychological well-being? Could it have been accomplished with less uh, onerous means? I mean. It seems like you just, I don't own them, but it, it said that they basically just picked one person to get the easy way. They didn't like try the best way to do it. How could they have achieved the same interest that, without taking uh, an easement? How could California have achieved the exact same end without taking an easement? Even easier. What, what, what kind of land use regulation could they have passed to achieve this end much easier? Yeah. Yeah. They could have said, don't build anything tall right here. Don't obstruct the line of sight. What we're looking for is a fit, a nexus. Don't let this word nexus fool you. It just means a fit. What is the relationship between the government's interest and what they're doing? Okay, so the interest is we want a clear path to view the beach, right? We want to, like, you know, you can see the water like right here. We want to be able to see the view. So what is the, you know, the, the closest way or the, the, the most narrowly tailored way of achieving that? That's what narrow tailoring means. We use these words. We don't even know what they mean. How can the government achieve that interest in the least cumbersome way to the property owner? Well, we can say, don't build anything tall right here. Or keep this path clear. Or keep it well lit. Right? These are various things the government can do. But what they want is like a nuclear bomb. They want an easement. They want to take a chunk of his fee simple and slice it down the middle. Scalia says that is a road too far, no pun intended. We can't, we can't do that. If they had a, a, a regulation that said, all right, don't build anything tall right here, Scalia would have been okay with that. So they're looking for how close the fit is. Okay? Now, Anselmo, what's, what does Justice Brennan say in dissent about why this is odd? Or what... What, what, what trouble is Justice Brennan in dissent about this? Uh, that, the, that the state should be able to use police power to take the, to take the property for the benefit of the, of the Don't say take. You're right, but don't say take, because once you say take, you have to pay. Yes. Regulate. That's exactly right. Brennan's like, well, dude, what, what is this? Why are we being so skeptical? of the government's power. Going back to Euclid, you know, the zoning case from Cleveland. Uh, going back to Hatticheck. These are all cases where the states are given broad latitude to um, you know, decide what the appropriate way to use land is. Like, who are we to tell the government that instead of saying, take an easement, you should be uh, you know, having a, a height restriction? Who are we to tell the government that? That's not our job as courts. We should not be second guessing them. It's clear this opinion, second guessing. saying, listen, you had this law, we should have had this law instead. And that is something which courts are very loath to do because you're second-guessing legislature. You made this decision, we should have made a different decision. Okay? Now, um, before uh, Andrew said, we're talking about rational basis review. Uh, uh, Andrew, is this, is this rational basis review? What's Scalia doing? What, what, what's Nino up to? Well, he sort of, when I was reading it, uh, I got the impression that when he takes the approach of the Fifth Amendment, he tries to have a balance on it. Uh, on the state's interest and the public's interest and goes back to that we should uh, uh, look to what the legislatures um, were trying to advance and call it a substantial advancing of what's the, the legitimate state interest. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what Scalia is doing is, is a form of a judicial inquiry where he's basically forcing the government to prove their case. What Brennan does is not only is he willing to accept whatever rationales the government gives, but if you read closely, he actually made up his own. He said, we will uphold any law that the government could have rationally passed. 
Rational basis review is not limited to, did the government have a rational basis? It's, could they have had a rational basis? And what that gives the, the court the power to do is to make one up. The court actually makes up a reason about why this could be a valid, uh, valid law, even if that wasn't the reason the government had. Um, litigating against a rational basis test is basically impossible because it's a moving target. The court can always make up a, a, a reason why the government acted properly after the fact. And if you're a lawyer, you're all going to be a lawyer soon, try arguing against a side that you know what that side's saying. Like, try making five arguments in court of why this law is unconstitutional. And then the court writes an opinion saying, okay, those five reasons are good, but here's a sixth reason why you didn't think of why the law is constitutional. I'm not kidding you. I'll give you an example right here from the Fifth Circuit. Uh, very recently, so Louisiana, uh, I think there were a couple of Louisianans in the room, they passed a law saying that in order to sell caskets, you need to be a licensed mortician, right? That might sound like a good law. But you had these, uh, uh, these monks, uh, you know, the, these Catholic monks in, in, in Louisiana, and they made these very uh, simple uh, boxes. They're basically carved boxes of pine wood, and they sold them to the members of their church at a huge discount. If anyone's ever been involved in a funeral, caskets are expensive. The, the morticians and funeral parlors, they, they really raise the rate. So these were just monks, and they were, you know, they were carving these boxes themselves, you know, very simple, no, no designs, and they were selling them for a fraction of the cost. And Louisiana said, no, you can't do that because you're not a licensed mortician. And to become a mortician, you have to go to school for like eight years. You have to have an apprenticeship. You have to have an embalming machine in your facility. You have to have all these steps. And uh, this was actually a case challenge under the rational basis test. And very interestingly, the Fifth Circuit just had an opinion maybe two months ago where they said, you know, this law doesn't have a valid reason. The only valid reason we have here is economic protectionism. This is a law passed to uh, benefit the morticians of Louisiana. That's why this law exists. This is not helping consumers. And they found it unconstitutional. That's the anomaly. That's the outlier. More often than not, they'll say, well, you know, the government could have had a good reason for this law, maybe for health and safety. Uh, you know, maybe they want to ensure that people are buried in a certain way. Uh, but the Scalia opinion here actually shows some teeth. He's actually willing to scrutinize the government. That's the outlier. And if you can say Brennan is irate at it, he is. He's upset. It's like, this is not what courts are supposed to do. Brennan will just make up any reason necessary to find the law constitutional. That, that's how he, uh, he'll treat the property clause of the Constitution. Okay? All right, question about that case. All right, let's do the, uh, let's do the uh, Dolan case, and I'll wrap up and let you have time for the, uh, the uh, evaluation. So uh, I, think, I think Nolan was 87. Right, and then the Dolan case was 94. So in that, in that seven-year period between, there was a question about how, how do we, what's the appropriate test, right? So Scalia throws out this word nexus, which doesn't really mean anything. And, you know, how close of a nexus does it have to be? And the Dolan case is where they resolve it. So this is actually the, land, this is actually the shop in the Dolan case. And it was right near this kind of creek. And you can kind of see it better here. This, uh, this kind of like a little creek behind the, uh, the shop right there. Kind of a, not a very good picture, but it's good enough. And um, generally speaking, one of the major issues with industrialization is you're turning grass, which is very absorbable, you know, into cement. So if you have a floodplain where there's a little creek and it's going to flood you know, every year or so, and you're turning you know, mushy grass into cement, there's going to be runoff. Water will not absorb into the land. And that's how you have flooding. Um, one of the reasons why Staten Island, my home, had such bad flooding in Hurricane Sandy was because a lot of the uh, wetlands had been filled with cement, and they'd been turned into you know, residential areas. So from the last hurricane 100 years ago, Staten Island weathered it, no pun intended, much better. Uh, uh, Oregon actually had a similar policy, where they wanted what they called dedication of the land. Did anyone bother looking that phrase up? So a dedication of land basically means you dedicate it to nature. Uh, you basically give the land to the government so that you can't build on it to, to dedicate it to nature. So instead of you know, filling it with cement or asphalt or whatever, you let the land you know, stay natural. So if there's a flood, the floodplain comes in, the water is absorbed to the ground, and you know, the, the city is not flooded. So the government had this idea of saying, listen, Mr. Dolan, you want to expand your, your shop, you want to you know, add more sparking spots, fine, but you need to give us a lot of your land to dedicate it. And he said, no, I don't want to do this because this isn't related. This isn't close enough. Okay? So the Rehnquist opinion kind of went through saying, would this be an exaction? And, and they kind of put together this, this two-factor two test, which, which was in uh, the, the, the Nolan case, but not clearly enough. So the first factor 
is whether there's an ex whether there is an uh, essential nexus okay between the uh, the legitimate state interest and the permit condition okay uh, 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 Kelsey what, what does that mean oh let me scroll I'm sorry please tell me to scroll the other class is much better at yell me why don't why don't scroll you guys are slow on it so what there's one girl that's right there she yells me every time I don't scroll so be on it so Kelsey what does that mean an essential nexus between the legitimate state interest and the permit condition. What does that actually mean? Um, I guess, like, the permit condition or the regulation is actually the state interest. Yes. Yes, so in the last case, you know, the state has an interest in having the psychological well-being that knowing the beach is public. Okay, that's fine. But requiring easement is overkill. It's requiring too much to get there. So you have the state interest and you have the permit condition. So there has to be this nexus. Okay, that, that sounds fine. But the second part is where the rubber meets the road. So if there's a nexus, what is the required degree of connection between the uh, exaction and the uh, and proposed development? This is the tougher one. How close of a fit does there have to be between the exaction thing they're requiring and the proposed development? So in this case, uh, the, 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 the guy just wants to expand his shop, right? And his, his land is pretty close to this floodplain, okay? So, um, uh, Allison, uh, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, uh, Tracy, is there, does, does, does the majority find that there's just kind of a close fit between the two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't want you to get too carried away because the, the, the facts of this case are, are not quite as important uh, because the entire environmental thing, it, it's somewhat confusing even to me exactly <laughs> with floodplains and all that stuff. But, 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 but generally speaking, uh, Rose, how, how close of a fit does Rehnquist want in order for there to be an uh, exaction? What, what's the test he comes up with? It was towards the end. He went through like, all the various state Supreme Courts, and he finally came to the one at the end. Yeah, that's it. Rough proportionality. Okay. Rough proportionality. So that's be rough proportionality, okay? What does that mean? Well, we know it's not rational basis. He rejects that. He says it's not rational basis. So in other words, we're not going to do what Brennan wants to do. We're not going to allow the government to make up a reason after the fact. We're not going to allow the courts to make up a reason. The government has the burden, and that is the key. If you ever do constitutional litigation, and even, the most important question is who has the burden? Because the party with the burden usually loses. If the individual has the burden to prove why the government is acting wrong, you're probably going to lose. If the government has the burden to prove why they're not acting wrong, the individual is probably going to win. So Rehnquist says the burden goes to the government. The city has to justify this decision. The city has to show that this is not arbitrary. So even though in this case the, uh, the, the proposed land use regulation would probably uh, prevent flooding, it's not enough. Okay. All right. Any questions about that? All right. Thank you. Thank you for a great semester. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. All right. So, thank you much. So, take care of these, and I'll see you all too. Thank you. Thank you. And email me questions now if you have questions for the uh, uh, and also I'll do them in the order in which you email them.